supporting a warm, ice-free coastline with resources to sustain a lot more life. Though experts have, of course, debunked its imaginative suggestions and downplayed its significance ever since. Yet while most have general faith in the map-making of modern experts, it may be significant that the actual satellite images of what officials claim is a fully explored continent are actually composited together in a mosaic with a gaping hole in the middle around the South Pole. This is supposedly the truest picture of Antarctica that we're given, courtesy of the NASA Landsat program, which admittedly continually replaces and edits the composite, including when whiteout strikes. So the question that remains is, are we seeing what's really there? These satellite images are often stunning and give us a photorealistic picture of our planet, but like a video game with convincing graphics, satellite images are still only a representation of what's really there. They have flaws, and like all maps, the images simply aren't the actual territory. That may seem like a nitpicky point, but it's an important distinction to make, especially when we see large portions of what look like painted over or blurred out areas of the continent where bases are supposed to be located. Considering even super secretive Area 51 shows up pretty clear on Google Earth, you have to ask yourself, what's really in Antarctica that in 2017 we still supposedly don't have sophisticated enough technology for the general public to see it? Investigations that West Antarctica and East Antarctica are actually two continents separated by an under-ice channel have largely been upheld. The Trans-Antarctic Mountains and the chain of mountains up the Palmer Peninsula connect with the Andes Range nearly touching South America where they were once connected by a land bridge. The questions began as soon as Antarctica was quote-unquote found. Have they, or will they, unearth something significant from humanity's past? Despite being told the entire continent is basically an icy, barren wasteland where hardly anything could survive or thrive, with no native human population other than visiting scientists, Freezing waste without people, without life, without vegetation. Nature's most formidable challenge to man. Earlier reports show this is simply not the case. All the way back in 1893, Captain Larson reported discovering petrified wood and worms on Seymour Island as well as a captivating area with dozens of clay balls placed on top of what looked like pillars, which had the appearance of having been made by the hand of man. But these were later dismissed as basalt that happened to collapse into the appearance of carefully sculpted clay balls on top of pillars. Between 1928 and 1930, then Commander Richard Byrd completed the first of five major modern expeditions to explore the Antarctic, and right away his team were captivated by evidence that there had once been a warmer climate while they were surveying vast tracts of otherwise icy land at the bottom of the earth. This expedition, which cost $400,000, was financed by Edsel Ford and John D. Rockefeller Jr., among others. A 1930 article on Byrd's first mission noted, quote, They expect in time to solve what is perhaps the world's greatest mystery, the existence of extensive vegetation of the vast uplands near the South Pole thousands of years ago, noting sufficient geological evidence to prove that at one time, Antarctica was once warm enough to support at least a rich vegetable life. In 1947, the U.S. Navy claimed they found a place they named the Bunger Oasis, though it may have been explored earlier. The Soviets established a research station there during their expedition in 1956 at the now defunct Polish A.B. Dabrowski Polar Station in a fascinating 200 square mile iceless area. At the same time, it was noted that the Russians moved so much equipment and supplies into the oasis that Australian and New Zealand diplomats were convinced they may be setting up permanent air and submarine bases there. No wonder that one of the most compelling anomalies spotted on satellite images of Antarctica is only 35 miles from the Soviet base, in what appears to many to be a domed metal lid over some sort of underground entrance. In the meantime, no one has even confirmed or fully debunked the suspicions of conspiracy theorists on what this image even shows. Throughout further wide-scale explorations in the 40s and 50s, scientists on military expeditions reported finding ice-free oases with waterfalls cascading down rocky cliffs into dry valleys containing freshwater lakes on the interior of the continent, mountain ranges reaching thousands of feet above icy wastes, fossilized trees, and even the remains of petrified forests. 
1957, the U.S. military acknowledged finding at least two other oasis locations in Antarctica only a few hundred miles from the South Pole, both free of ice and large enough to house entire air bases. But the military wouldn't disclose the locations to prevent other nations from potentially establishing bases there. These oases reportedly have a radically different climate from the rest of the continent. Places free of ice and snow where the soil can reach temperatures of 77 degrees Fahrenheit at midday, and warm winds blow over freshwater lakes where strange specimens grow. While transversing the interior, a seismologist gave his account in 1958 of coming across a fresh lake a hundred yards across with pinkish flowers growing in the bottom of it, which he could not identify. Experts have concluded these areas could sustain year-round human settlements, yet these highly contrasted landscapes are often difficult to spot when browsing through satellite imagery for whatever reason. Antarctica's past life as a tropical oasis is further upheld by the discovery of geothermal heated lakes, where almost any form of life could have survived and even continued up until this point, even while the rest of the continent froze over. The Russians at Vostok Station confirmed the discovery of a huge freshwater lake buried nearly two miles under the ice cap that they named Lake Vostok. It has attracted a great deal of attention ever since they've successfully drilled through the ice cap and collected active biological samples of living bacteria from a liquid lake that has otherwise been an isolated ecosystem for what scientists claim is as much as 15 million years. Located at the so-called South Pole of Cold, Lake Vostok is nearly as big as Lake Ontario and at 6,000 square miles in surface area, 160 miles in length, and 30 miles of width. It measures to an astounding depth of more than 2,600 feet at some points. And scientists claim they've found more than 3,500 life forms, as well as rich fossil evidence from a time that they've up until now known nothing about. Even more curious, however, was the confirmed discovery of a huge magnetic anomaly on the east coast of this underground lake that spans a vast 65 by 47 miles. Mainstream scientists hypothesized that a thinning of the Earth's crust at that location caused the anomaly, while others suggested a meteorite hit there, while still others suggest that the dimensions of such a significant magnetic anomaly could signify a lost city on the shores of the underground lake. With so much secrecy shrouding Antarctica, do you think the public would be told if something were found there? Interestingly, it parallels the plot to the film 2001 A Space Odyssey. Scientists on the moon unearth a vast Tycho magnetic anomaly that proves to be a monolithic signal device from an unseen extraterrestrial race. Hundreds of these subglacial lakes are known to exist, and most remain still unexplored. However, when scientists drilled under the ice cap of a much shallower and smaller subglacial lake known as Lake Willens, they found living jellyfish, crustaceans, and even 8-inch translucent pink fish, and what they said was an old ecosystem eroding from the ice hovering above the lake. These finds and more continue to fuel speculation as they have over the past century, that Antarctica is holding on to secret links to mankind's past, and possibly the remnants of ancient civilizations which could have resided there in warmer times. Despite the appearance of being completely peaceful and solely dedicated to international cooperative scientific research, and despite the public being repeatedly told for decades that Antarctica officially holds, quote, no military value, the massive continent and its surrounding islands in the polar region are of great strategic significance. The place doesn't just lay idle and ownerless. And this surrounds perhaps the biggest secret of Antarctica, an open and rather obvious one. The 1959 Antarctic Treaty signed by a dozen nations that include the U.S., Argentina, Australia, Chile, New Zealand, Norway, Russia, France, and the United Kingdom put in place the appearance of a harmonious international atmosphere where Cold War hostilities are rejected and peace is permanent. But in reality, major military forces remain embedded there, outwardly serving as the custodians of man's activities on the continent. And it remains true with now 53 signatories. Significantly, the 1959 treaty immediately followed the 1957-1958 International Geophysical Year, 
which organized dozens of nations to participate in the Antarctic and other parts of the globe to establish permanent scientific bases and conduct unprecedented exploration and experimentation. The recommendation to make 5758 an IGY event was initiated by astrophysicist Dr. James Van Allen, who was working with the Navy to test his developing theories about the geomagnetic forces that surround the planet, including the intense bands of harmful radiation that bear Van Allen's name. Meteorologist and Navy contractor Harry Wexler was working closely on this research as well and was appointed chief U.S. scientist for the International Geophysical Year, which created a dual pretext for upper atmosphere tests and weather experiments that served both military and scientific interests and for creating a permanent military backbone that could provide continuous support for bases, transport, and logistics. The main job that faced the CBs during the second year at Antarctica was the building of five new bases. Each of these stations would supply vital information to the various scientific projects of the IGY program. Science gave the U.S., Russia, and Great Britain's military the justification needed for a permanent mission in the South Pole. Operation Deep Freeze was commenced by the U.S. in 1955, two years before the International Geophysical Year, sending thousands of Naval and Air Force troops, as well as militarized construction units from the Navy Seabees to carve out permanent bases to support the scientific effort. In less than one month, pilots of EX-6 mapped and photographed over a million square miles of territory. Operation Deep Freeze created a never-ending permanent mission for the military amid a climate of international cooperation. The opportunity for cover and secrecy was astounding. In proposing the bases, members of the U.S. National Security Council forced an improbable merger between their national military goals and the International Geophysical Year program, silencing early opposition from the scientific community via the recognition that a military-backed mission channeled through the National Science Foundation would bring nearly unlimited funds for the projects they had championed, albeit at the cost of quietly acknowledging that parallel military activities were taking place largely in secret. The activities of Operation Deep Freeze 1, the glacier with Admiral Dufek aboard, made a notable cruise around the Antarctic continent. The purpose of this voyage was to locate suitable sites for more IGY stations to be established in later operations. The glacier's cruise around the continent brought Deep Freeze 1 to a successful conclusion. Under the treaty, territorial claims are not addressed, though new claims are prohibited. With the status quo on ice, the U.S., British, and Russian installations remain like Antarctica's other secrets, frozen from political interference. But this form of peace can be deceiving and belie anything lurking just beneath the surface. With the treaty not taking effect until 1961, Operation Deep Freeze was a huge preemptive military mobilization effort to establish a permanent foothold on the continent. The only real question is, how far did they get? There have been many rumors about underground bases on Antarctica, but by their very virtue they are difficult to confirm, and as a result, legends, rumors, and imaginations run wild. And yet, there is solid evidence to support the idea that a significant military-industrial complex is indeed embedded underneath Antarctica's icy facade. Most of the early expeditions to Antarctica in the later 1800s and early 1900s were largely concerned with establishing claims and merely surviving the harsh environment. With improved technology, flight became viable, as did ice-breaking ships and specialized vehicles for ice-capped terrain. In the 1920s, U.S. Navy Admiral Richard E. Byrd achieved fame as the first person to fly over both the North and South Poles, though not without controversy. Byrd's first of five expeditions to Antarctica from 1928 to 1929 was privately sponsored by backers including the Rockefellers and Fords, seeking uranium, coal, and shale deposits, gold, copper, and other exploitable minerals, as well as locations to establish base camps. Byrd established Little America, among other camps, which was later plunged into the sea by the shifting ice. Byrd's second 1934-1935 expedition focused more on weather. Publicly, the expedition was mostly known for Byrd's dramatic wintering in alone at a meteorological station where he nearly died of carbon monoxide poisoning from a poorly vented stove, yet he lived to publish a best-selling account of it. Behind the drama, it was a major effort to study the relationship between seismic activity, geomagnetic forces, atmosphere, and weather. 
James Van Allen, who discovered the Van Allen radiation belts that bear his name, took part in Byrd's second expedition as assistant to the chief scientist, and later became a driving force in Antarctic weather experimentation, while Byrd helped the U.S. secure its claims there. Hitler's right-hand man, Hermann Goering, personally signed off on Germany's third expedition to Antarctica, and its first since before World War I. This became the infamous New Schwabenland Nazi expedition launched in 1938 and completed officially in 1939, just before initiating war with Poland. It was to be a secret reconnaissance expedition, with only 33 members plus the ship's crew. Following a German whaling expedition in 1937 to 38, it aimed ostensibly at increasing the production of fat for the coming war effort. However, the real mission was clearly to establish permanent bases for Nazi raids and other naval activities. The Nazis staked out claims and dropped flags from planes over a large 231,000 square kilometer area, taking some 16,000 aerial color photos along with prospector data to support legal claims based on the right of exploration, utterly disregarding previous claims by Norway over Queen Maudland. Finding out about the secret mission through their German diplomat, Norway quickly attempted to annex the territory by decree three days before the Nazi expedition even reached Antarctica. But it didn't deter Germany, who issued a decree in August 1939 after the mission, establishing a German Antarctic sector, officially called New Schwabenland. Less than a year later, in 1940, Germany had invaded and occupied both Norway and Queen Maudland. Even mainstream historians admit officially that there is evidence of at least minor Nazi coastal bases in Antarctica, ones that were large enough to dock German battleships during the war. But there's no clear record of activities beyond that. Unofficially, rumors allege that several Nazi U-boats that disappeared from the records had carried top officials including Hitler to the South Pole after the war and that a more extensive and permanent base existed. If this holds any truth, one possible location for a substantial fortress would have been the 200-square-mile ice-free Schirmacher Oasis, which the Nazis had first identified from the air and which supported numerous international stations after the war. Either way, after their 1938-39 New Schwabenland expedition commenced, Admiral Byrd was sent to Antarctica from 39 to 40, on a U.S. government-sponsored mission to establish permanent bases, further exploration, and most assuredly to spy on Nazi efforts there. In turn, news of Nazi bases drove support for building more American bases there. Though modern scholars have tried to downplay the existence of Nazi bases, news reports of the time captured the concern, as this article highlights that, quote, the capture of a secret Nazi hideout proves valuable naval bases can be built in ice fields. It also stated, quote, there, hidden away in some undisclosed quarter of the Antarctic quadrant, a British naval patrol recently found a Nazi naval base. True, it was only of small dimensions, yet it was sufficiently enough equipped to have repaired even the Graf Spee referring to the notorious Nazi commercial raider that was attacking British commerce ships. A 1942 article asked U.S. naval bases in the Antarctic and began discussing, quote, the possibility of using the Antarctic continent as one of the jumping off places for the great naval offensive that would wipe Japan's rising sun flag off the face of the southern seas. And it discussed how it would become a pivot from which we could guard and control both the South Atlantic and the South Pacific. Clearly, Antarctica had become an important military position. Admiral Byrd also made this point at the time of his 1940 expedition, saying, As we all know, the Panama Canal may be under attack someday. It may even be destroyed by a hostile power. The Navy has to think of such a possible eventuality. That is why Antarctica looms in strategic value. The British formalized its efforts to surveil and counter Nazi presence in the Antarctic during World War II under Operation Tabarin where they sought to establish major Antarctic bases. The name Tabarin references a famous charlatan and street performer from the 17th century who used trickery and guile to hawk snake oil cures and put on provocative acts. The mission sought to utilize any pretext to occupy key Antarctic islands and counter illegitimate Nazi claims in Queen Maudland. The British saw it as a power play to stave off Axis domination of the southernmost routes, 
especially between South America's tip and the Upper Peninsula. Britain reported not only Nazi bases there, but vexing Japanese whaling expeditions as well. And a definitive move was needed to outmaneuver Nazi-friendly Argentina, who held the de facto claim to influence over the region. The British occupied several key positions, including Deception Island, a tiny donut-shaped piece of land known for having the only ideal sheltered anchorage in Antarctica, but also host to an active volcano under its calm waters, as well as Hope Bay, an ice-free coast on the tip of Palmer Peninsula, as well as the more northern Falkland Islands, which it had first claimed in 1908. In short, this is closely related to why Britain felt strongly enough about the place to fight a war with Argentina for the Falkland Islands in the 1980s, long after Britain's empire had supposedly faded. These strongholds and others were necessary to defend the important passage routes between the South Atlantic and Pacific Oceans, vital to the commercial and military affairs of both Britain and America, as well as to contend for supremacy in Antarctica. In World War II, the British fired upon the Germans' notorious Graf Spee pocket battleship in 1939 during the Battle of River Plate. A previous report indicated that British believed the Graf Spee was docking at a covert base in Antarctica and raided its commercial vessels. Though it wasn't heavily damaged, the Graf Spee was forced to scuttle to Uruguay and abandon crew after its critical fuel cleaning system was destroyed. Captain Langsdorf committed suicide, and dozens of people died. The quiet battle for control of the Southern Oceans had now cost blood. Under Tabarin, Britain tore down Argentinian flags and destroyed whaling stations that could supposedly be used by the Nazis and set up their own bases and stations to replace them. In the post-war era, Britain made fresh claims over the South Shetland Islands, the South Georgia Islands, and the Falkland Islands, even after the 1959 treaty. More secretly, the British built a significant base, known as Modheim Base, on the mainland of eastern Antarctica and in the general vicinity of the Nazis' new Schwabenland base and Queed Maudland. An advanced base was also built in the ice-free portions of the mountains near the Pyramid Nunatuck but it remains little known and obscure even on modern satellite images. Utilizing underground tunnels to connect tiny research huts and a sophisticated system to protect the base from snow and ice damage over time. In fact, it is very hard to find any mentions or any information at all about the Modheim bases in newspapers after the mid-1950s. It was with the assertion of British power on the southern continent that U.S. Admiral Richard E. Byrd launched Operation High Jump. And with the wartime conclusion of Operation Tabarin, British interest in the Antarctic essentially rolled over into Allied interest with the U.S., almost seamlessly continuing during the U.S.-led military invasion to conquer Antarctica. It was completely unprecedented. Admiral Richard Byrd and Rear Admiral Richard Cruzen led some 4,700 men and brought 13 Navy vessels, an icebreaker ship, an aircraft carrier, battleships, a state-of-the-art submarine, and a fleet of planes and helicopters developed for the extreme cold to surround the continent and establish new bases. This largest ever polar deployment served as an exercise for cold weather warfare to oppose communist aggression and came with the talking points of protecting against an enemy operating from the poles and able to mobilize very quickly. Thus, the U.S. intended to establish a permanent presence there. At the mission's conclusion, Byrd told reporters embedded with him Quote, the almost terrifying rate of speed at which our world is shrinking is the great object lesson. We can no longer believe that distance guarantees us safety, that oceans and poles will be our ever-protecting no-man's land. If he could succeed in taking 4,000 young Americans into the cold and unknown Antarctic, that others could do the same as well. But Admiral Byrd was forced to retreat from the mission after only a few months. Newspaper accounts blamed the ice and the freezing up of the waterways, the same excuse mentioned ahead of time in papers before the expedition departed. Some have claimed that Byrd met a superior force that even possessed UFO aircraft that drove Byrd out of Antarctica. But this account is largely substantiated by a quote which attributed Admiral Byrd as saying, in case of a new war, the continental U.S. would be attacked by flying objects, which could fly pole to pole at incredible speeds. However, retrieval of the article this quote was said to appear in, 
dated March 5, 1947, and written by Lee Van Atta, an international news service correspondent who accompanied the expedition, carried a different account, with a few similarities from which grains of truth were plucked. It read, quote, Rear Admiral Richard E. Byrd warned that the U.S. must guard against any future invasion by hostile aircraft from across the polar regions of the Earth which bears a resemblance yet a different meaning from the phrase flying objects which could fly pole to pole. The admiral declared it is no scare phrase but a bitter reality to state that conflict, should it ever come again, will lash out at our nation over one or both poles. Byrd's warning was couched in the post-war narrative of a Soviet threat, which Byrd used after the war to justify cold weather, cold war training near both poles, which Byrd initially oversaw. Lesser known is the fact that the U.S. followed up the very next year in 1947-48 with Operation Windmill, which continued survey operations and even more significantly furthered the study of electromagnetic effects on weather at the South Pole, though the mission was also aborted early. The U.S. hesitated and backed off from a planned Operation High Jump 2 due to international pressure and suspicion about the militarization of the South Pole. Instead, it opted for the peaceful approach of Operation Deep Freeze that began a few years later in 1955, just ahead of the international treaty. It should be noted, just after World War II, the first nuclear war, that it was mentioned multiple times in the papers that not only was Antarctica a probable source of coal. We found enough of coal within 180 miles of the South Pole in a great uh, ridge of mountains. It's not covered with snow, enough to supply the whole world for quite a while. But also a vast stores of uranium, which multiple countries, including Britain, were down there in search of. Where that coal is gets 100 below zero in the winter. Well, uh, it was once tropical. So uh, we think there's oil there and there's evidence, probably uranium there. The year after World War II ended, at the same time papers were quietly announcing in tiny articles buried in their back pages that Antarctica might be hiding large stores of uranium under its ice, a law and diplomacy professor at Tufts College was warning that the new free areas of the world, like Antarctica would become under the 1959 treaty only a dozen years later, should be placed under the control of the United Nations, quote, thereby establishing the first tiny toehold of world government in practice. Professor Leo Gross went on to say that the suspected presence of uranium in Antarctica necessitates the UN to act right away to, quote, start a pool of world government into which the nations could one day jump themselves, as many believe they will have to do before lasting world order can be established. Is it any secret? Is there uranium there? That would be the only thing that would be practical to uh, actually go after, I suppose. Everything else would be economically uh, unfeasible, wouldn't it? Well, as we recklessly expend our resources, the time will come, and we can, we'll have to go after that stuff down there. Well, you know, I, I avoided what you said about uranium. I'm not sure about that. I don't want to have the world fight over the Antarctic. And Robert, is there a competition among other nations to try to get information about uh, Antarctica and to possibly to secure some of these resources? Well, uh, yes. Uh, there are now seven nations very much interested. During the construction of these major installations, tunnels were dug between buildings, Tunnels were dug for supplies and utility units and for specialized equipment. Underground entrances and bases were expanded and reinforced to protect against the harsh weather. Were there secret underground military facilities constructed during or after this time? Were there any banned weapons tests or military activities and installations that went fully operational before the Antarctic Treaty set in? The answers are mostly silent like the vast, icy wastelands that have intrigued so many searchers. Below the surface of a giant ice cap, a city is buried. Some very interesting disclosures were declassified about U.S. military installations in Greenland, which took place in the 1960s with the cooperation of Denmark and NATO. This is the story of Camp Century, the city under ice. While feeding European allies and the American people a highly publicized cover story about the triumphs over nature and building an underground city for research under the ice at Greenland's Camp Century. The basic concept was simple. A system of 23 trenches would be dug into the ice cap and then covered with steel arches and snow. 
Branching off the main communication trench would be a series of lateral trenches housing complete research, laboratory and test facilities, modern living quarters and recreation areas, and a complex of support facilities. The Pentagon kept its real activities a secret. Only later did the truth about top secret project Iceworm surface. The Pentagon was attempting to put in place mobile nuclear launching sites that would utilize thousands of miles of tunnels to station ICBMs from theoretically random positions, all without Denmark's knowledge or consent. Later, an escape hatch would be placed at the end of a small wooden form for an emergency exit. Were similar installations attempted in Antarctica? Like Greenland's Camp Century, Antarctica's McMurdo and Bird stations also featured a nuclear reactor, as well as under ice tunnels. Sixteen of these escape hatches were strategically located throughout the various tunnels. The inconvenient fact is that the U.S. lied to its international allies about nuclear weapon sites in Greenland, so it's fair game to question whether they did the same in the seemingly peaceful and cooperative atmosphere of frigid ice and penguin research. The same questions apply to Admiral Byrd's equally publicized Operation Icebox, a tentative plan to partner with private corporations and bury food surplus in Antarctica. Perhaps it was just another cover for building an extensive underground tunnel system. It was talked about in interviews and papers from the time, but seemingly never materialized. This diagram shows how they can effortlessly dig a continuous trench then place shipping containers and rebury for long-term storage. The article advertised, quote, We plan to bury a cache of 100 loaves of bread every year over the next 100 years. We won't be here to finish the experiment, but our great-grandchildren will. We could create a permanent icebox for our food surpluses in the Antarctic, save on storage, and contribute a great act of international goodwill. Again, Greenland may be a blueprint for what was attempted in Antarctica. It should also be noted that the 1961 Atomic Energy Commission had completed an extensive labyrinth of underground tunnels in the Nevada desert for the purposes of underground nuclear testing. The agency told the AP at the time, quote, the tunnels are being constructed for any use deemed necessary if and when the administration decides to resume nuclear testing. During Operation High Jump, an Arctic submarine laboratory was dispatched to Antarctica from a California naval base where it tested under ice operations with great success. This was a pivotal moment for underwater and polar warfare. Prior to launch, Admiral Byrd contacted Dr. Waldo Lyon, the top naval warfare submarine guy at their San Diego base, to ask him if there was any research he wanted to do in conjunction with the expedition. Lyon asked to test a new submarine in the ice-filled waters, and so they did. This Antarctic deployment was the first major field trial for sub-Arctic submarine conditions, with success leading to new capabilities such as breaking through ice to surface and launching a nuclear warhead from underwater in range of Cold War targets anywhere on the map. Moreover, thousands of men were deployed to dew-line distant early warning stations in North Canada and Greenland, and to submarines and aircraft patrolling the Bering Sea and northern Arctic waters under training originally supervised by Admiral Byrd. No further military tests were ever admitted in Antarctica, despite a massive militarization on the ice. And what came of the breakthroughs in ice core drilling, ice melting cryobots, deep sea sea lab experiments designed for Arctic waters, and the 500 meter depths of its continental shelf? All of this must have made Antarctica's frozen abyss more accessible. Yet has anything significant been found? Have any bases been constructed there using tunnel boring systems utilizing natural caves or geothermal hotspots. It's a big continent, so it's a very intriguing and perhaps plausible maybe. Again, Greenland may be a blueprint for what was attempted in Antarctica. Another little known and underexplained role in Antarctica is that of NASA engineers who sent units to train for conditions that might be found in space. Numerous press reports in the 50s and 60s made the point of comparing Antarctica's conditions to that of the Moon and Mars, cold, unforgiving, and remote. High-ranking officials, including Werner von Braun, conducted special training missions there, including one to prepare for tunneled underground bases on the Moon, like the ones in Antarctica. Other NASA reports have remarked on the similar mountainous terrain, 
But did these training missions for space travel also double as an opportunity to upgrade and expand military bases under peaceful pretext in the region? Did NASA take advantage of the reclusive area as a secret launching base? How many rockets were being test-fired here? And what was the real purpose? And in early fall 1963, there were claims made that a nuclear bomb was detonated on the Antarctic continent. But as it did not register fallout, it was believed to have been set off either in the upper atmosphere where previous tests had been conducted or underneath the ice sheet. But the news was smothered. Despite the fact that this August 1963 blast, or test, was detected two days before the U.S. and Russia signed the Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, the White House ordered the detection of the explosion to be kept quiet until after the Senate voted on ratifying the Grand Sweeping Treaty. The DOD originally denied that any explosion took place, and even tried to pass it off as a natural phenomenon before later conceding that it had in fact happened. The U.S. quietly pointed fingers at the Soviet Union, and months before his assassination, JFK decided to call for inspections of Russian bases in Antarctica under the terms of the 1959 treaty. Though the U.S. military initially denied reports of a nuclear weapon being detected, the Navy quietly admitted that this was the case, immediately the day after Kennedy's assassination. We found it mentioned on page 12A, following page after page of detailed and emotional JFK assassination coverage. After that, the issue seemed to disappear from public view. Did the Russians, the United States, or a joint scientific venture between multiple countries set off a nuke in the upper atmosphere of the poles in order to create an artificial EMP or aurora effect? If they did, it may have been allowed under the Antarctic Treaty, if and only if it was purely for science, and all member states agreed. If so, whatever they found or tested has been kept entirely under wraps. The absolute biggest secret of all in Antarctica is the electromagnetic energy that surrounds and saturates life on planet Earth. How, precisely, does the magnetic energy from the poles create and modify weather? Why are the poles frozen? Why a huge landmass at one pole and an open ring of ocean at the other? Could the poles shift suddenly, rapidly changing climate and destroying existing life? Could science engineer the artificial melting of the poles in order to extrapolate the riches and resources buried underneath? Scientists, Antarctic explorers, and military figures alike have discussed how weather is made and controlled at the South Pole. Along with the accumulation of 90% of the world's ice and 60% of its fresh water reserves, which also controls oxygen content in the atmosphere. And Byrd, among others, has hinted at controlling the weather, something the Navy has always had a deep interest in. They established Camp Sky High, the first upper atmosphere VLF summer station on Antarctica at the base of the Antarctic Peninsula. It carried miles of wires spread out over the ice and sought to stimulate artificial auroral effects that would reciprocate with its conjugate radio site in Quebec, Canada. Resembling a gigantic peeled orange, this Rawin dome was assembled from prefabricated curved sections. Inside, it contained special equipment used for recording weather conditions. Another building, unusual in its dimensions, was the Aurora Airglow Tower. Skull and Bones journalist and op-ed extraordinaire William F. Buckley visited the South Pole and remarked on its use for weather control. Interacting with scientists studying hydrodynamics of the Earth's core, as well as geomagnetic effects on weather. Harry Wexler, the chief U.S. scientist who was experimenting with weather control, was put in charge of the International Geophysical Year in 1958. This was the same year that Harry Wexler saw his plans for bombarding the ionosphere with nuclear weapons undergo live tests in the Navy's 1958 Operation Argus, creating an artificial aurora burst hundreds of miles away at magnetic correlates from the firing positions. The Earth itself is a magnet. It acts as a dipole surrounded by a field of magnetic force. We see that the magnetic field extends a great distance from the Earth. Any one of these field lines can be thought of as lying in a shell. Advances in understanding the electromagnetic shield that protects the planet lent themselves to military attempts to manipulate the weather. The Navy confirmed that it could black out satellite and radio communications with high altitude explosions, eventually creating an EMP. What were their plans at the South Pole? Wexler was deep into this weather manipulation stuff, 
and leading the 1957 to 58 International Geophysical Year as chief U.S. scientist is very telling of the research objects of Antarctica. In his papers, Wexler had detailed specific designs for planetary scale manipulation of the Earth's climate using short and long-term radiation and inducing artificial worldwide climate change. Another of his plans was to set off enough hydrogen bombs in the Arctic Circle to melt the ice and increase the world's temperature. Or conversely, Wexler proposed launching a fine powder into equatorial orbit to reduce the Earth's temperature with permanent Saturn-like rings. He also formulated a detailed plan for bombarding the atmosphere with chlorine or bromine and punching a hole in the stratospheric ozone layer, proven to work in military tests, only to oppose the same plan later. Wexler was on a working vacation at the elite Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute with which he was affiliated when he died unexpectedly of a heart attack in 1962 at the young age of 51. Just months earlier, he gave a final speech to Woods Hole titled On the Possibilities of Climate Control, explaining the mechanisms not just to seed a few clouds, but to permanently control the Earth's climate. The terms of the 1959 Antarctic Treaty, barring military activities and preserving the world south of the 60 degree south latitude line for science, does not apply to U.S. Navy operations on the open seas. If any kind of atmospheric heater, HARP device, or SBX-1 radar device, or even a nuclear submarine is used to manipulate or alter weather offshore, there's no jurisdiction over its activities there outside of military doctrine and secret government control. And then there's the totality of it all. Support for international scientific research trumps all other considerations in Antarctica. Or perhaps it has provided the ultimate cover for maintaining a massive, permanent, off-limits continent that is one and a half times the size of the U.S. and within which they can run black projects away from the prying eyes of almost everyone else on the planet. Between the big push with Operation High Jump in 1946, where at least 190 Americans were left behind to continue operations, on through the next 15 years when the U.S. Navy and Air Force became the de facto custodians of the southern continent, the military took responsibility for at least five American permanent research stations with underground facilities, multiple atomic reactors, living quarters, and supply and transport for thousands of scientists around the continent. Great Britain had multiple expeditions to Antarctica during the late 1800s, the early 1900s, in World War I, and with classified operations during World War II, after which they never left, and their actions on the continent during that time are even less publicized. 